Hello everybody, welcome back. Today we're doing another Strengths of Materials problem. And today we're going to be dealing with another plane stress problem once again. But this time we're going to be considering the stress developed within an element. Now we don't know what an element is and we haven't talked about it before. So there's a lot of theory that I'm going to go over before the question begins. If you want to skip over, feel free to do so. But to explain what a stress element is, we're going to be looking at this question here. The question goes as follows. The stresses shown in the figure below act at a point in a stressed body. So let's consider a rod in the theory to try and explain what that means. And we're asked to determine the normal and shear stress at this point on the inclined plane AB. So not only are we looking at a stress element, we're looking at a section of that element to see what type of shear stress and normal stress are developed on that face. Now let's try to visualize what's actually going on in this problem. So if we look back to our very first video on stress, we were dealing with a known cross-sectional area which was parallel to an axis of reference. So we could take a slice of this section and we would know what area it was given. Then in the next video, where we derived inclined plane stresses, we took an angle theta with respect to that axis and we saw that the development of stress on that angle face is now different from what we were considering previously to that parallel face of the axis. But now we're considering something even more different which is taking a slice out of the element and pretty much looking at it as its own entity. So we take a super, super small or infinitesimally small element from the rod that we're analyzing. And this element is going to be based on dimensions dx, dy, and dz respectively. So what, what changes here? Why is this different from what we did before? Well, this changes that the previous mean of analysis uh, with the known area is no longer viable. Now we have areas that are based on functions of integration, otherwise calling it an arbitrary element. Now to analyze the element, we need to consider a face flush the xy plane and derive equations based on the stresses that are acting on each face to keep the element in equilibrium. Now luckily, we know what equilibrium is, and we've done problems with it before. But how are we going to visualize keeping the shape in equilibrium when we have a bunch of variables and we don't even know what they mean yet? Well, let's take a look at what's happening. Let's look at only shear first. So if we had a shear force, V, acting on this face, we know that on the opposite face, we're going to need to counteract that force with an equal but opposite magnitude similar to what we talked about before. And for Vy, it would be the same thing. However, now that force is going to be represented by the shear stress on that face, or shear yx, and then the area of that face, which would be the width times the length, which is dx times dz. And then similarly, you would have Vy equal to a similar formula, except now here, we're actually going to be considering, sorry for the typo, dy and dz, because we have that dy here, and the dz for the area. Now, to keep this element in equilibrium, we have to consider that there is a distance between the vx and the vy components on each face of this element. What does that mean? It's producing a couple moment with vx and a couple moment with vy. So we know for equilibrium to work, both of these couple of moments will have to equate to zero. So let's take a look at what a formula would look like for that. So if we had the Vy, which is equal to shear xy dy dz, and the distance of that couple dx, this would have to equal to the shear stress yx dx dz times the couple moment distance, which will be dy in this case. But you notice that all of these elements of length are going to be the same and they can actually cancel out, which leaves us with the conclusion that the shear stress on the xy face is going to equal to the shear stress, shear stress on the yx face. Now let's talk a little bit about what these subscripts actually mean first as well. So the first subscript is going to be for the normal face. So if we look first at shear xy, 
we have x here, which means the x-axis is normal to the face where the shear stress is developed. And then transversely, we have the second subscript, which is going to be y here. We have y, which is parallel to the face that it's acting on. Now we've satisfied the shear conditions for equilibrium. We also need to satisfy the normal conditions. So if we had normal stress y acting on both faces, there would be no couple moment created because they're acting collinearly, which in turn means that the normal stress at y does not have to equal the normal stress at x, which is the key difference between the two. And this leaves us with our final stress element that can be analyzed. And if we want to take it a step further, as we've done in previous videos, we can take a section of this element based on angle theta and derive for the normal stresses that are developed and the shear stresses that are developed based on that plane of reference, which are in turn solved using the stress transformation equations, which are down here for normal stress on that face and shear stress on that face. All right, so now we can finally hop to the problem. We have these stress transformation equations listed at the top here with the diagram demonstrating how we are going to solve for the shear stress and the normal stress on that plane. Now the conventions we need to follow are as follows. We need to consider that the stress normal is going to be positive if tensile and then negative if compressive. Then for shear stress, we are going to be considering it positive if it's pointed in the direction of a positive transverse axis. So if we look at the shear stress on this face, it is acting positively because it is parallel and moving in the same direction as this y-axis. And then similar with the x, so we're going to have a positive 75 MPA for that shear stress in the calculations. Now let's get into actually solving this problem finally. We are given that the shear stress at x, which is right here, is going to be negative 65 MPA because it is acting as a compressive stress on that element. And then same for normal stress at y, we have negative 125 MPA compressing that top face downwards. And similarly, shear stress x, y equals to shear stress y, x, which will be 75 MPA positive. Now for theta, this is where things get a little bit tricky, but to help us visualize this, we have a rule that we can follow. Theta is always measured counterclockwise with respect to the positive x-axis to the normal N axis of that plane. So in this diagram here, we can see that theta is going from x to n. However, in this case, we have a bit of a problem because we have our x axis here, but our normal axis is acting something like this. So what I've done is I've drawn a picture just to help us demonstrate how to find that new theta. So as you can see, if we orient that plane 90 degrees, we will actually be able to get this plane in the same orientation as our convention here. What this does is adds 90 degrees to the theta that we're considering. So from x to n, we would actually have 90 plus our angle theta, which is 55. So in turn, that means that theta is going to equal 90 plus 55, which equals to 145 degrees. Now it's just simple plug and chug, where we start with the normal stress on that plane, and I'll speed this part up just so we can skip past the boring bits. All right, so now we're left with our final answers after plugging everything in that we solved for. You guys can go ahead and calculate that if you want to double check the answer. But just to cover up what the final answers mean, we have a negative normal stress meaning that this is actually going to be a compressive stress. And that's the final answer for the normal stress acting on that plane. And then for the shear stress acting on that plane, we have a positive value, meaning that the orientation that the convention draws the shear stress in is correct and can be boxed as a final answer. Why is that? It's because it's pointing in the positive direction of that transverse T axis. All right, so I hope the theory helped to kind of explain what was going on in this problem. Uh, I, I know it's a lot of numbers and a little bit wordy, but once you get past the uh, tricks with the conventions and knowing how to arrange the equation so that it works for you, that pretty much gets you through the problem. So I hope this helped. Thanks for watching.